morning. We're glad to have you join us this morning for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. Hopefully uh, you've taken the opportunity to do something special for the moms in your life or are doing that there today. And so uh, this is a great day. I, maybe you've had the opportunity to invite your mom to come sit on the couch and uh, come to church with you today. Or you've maybe just gone to visit your mom and, and they can sit on the couch and, and there, or at the kitchen table and worship with her today as well and, and what a day that is we also know that it is uh, wonderful as this day is and we rejoice and we thank the mothers in our life we know that this can be a bittersweet day as well and so uh, we want to be mindful of those and we know that for some this is the first mother's day uh, having lost a mom and, and what a kind of a bitter uh, day that is as they're reminded of that and for maybe for those that maybe have experienced loss or miscarriage during this time we uh, are mindful of those but we are grateful for the mothers that we have and those who love us like mothers and the difference that they've made in our life. And uh, we want to just kind of take, take today just to say thank you to them and to show our gratitude uh, to them, to those that have helped to make a difference. So as part of that this morning, uh, if you're just logging on or hopefully you, you've kind of already logged on already, uh, we've got just a little video. Uh, we thought in all these days we have enough kind of uh, things that cause stress and pressure in our life. So we just have a little bit of video with a little bit of humor uh, that helps us to appreciate both our mothers as well as what they've taught us there. And so we have this little video of mom goggles. And I know there's certainly enough dads around us that need to have a pair of these. But uh, we hope that you enjoyed this little video to help to get us started here this morning. Are you guys sure you got this? Yeah. The twins are plugged in. Baby's asleep. How hard can this get? We're men. Besides, I bumped into Chuck Norris at a Pizza Hut once. I think his powers rubbed off on me. Get out of here. Go on, enjoy your mommy getaway weekend. Oh, this weekend was a bad idea. You remember what happened last time we watched the kids? I'm not a pinata! Get it off me! Get it off me! <laughs> Yeah, we're going to need help. Warning, use of this product may alter your perception of reality. <sighs> All right, everything looks the same. This is a joke. Guys, guys. Guys, it's like the Sahara in this cup. Can somebody hit me with some juice? <laughs> and listen, pulp, no pulp, doesn't make a difference to me. You're the ones dealing with the diaper. Mom goggles. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Sweetie, I need you to sit on your bottom. Listen to Daddy. You sit on your bottom, okay? Daddy's gonna come get you. Don't, don't, don't move. Don't, 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 don't dance. Just sit on your bottom. Okay? Daddy's gonna come get you. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't you try to stop me. Baby made a poopy, yes you did, dude. Where are your mom goggles? They wouldn't fit over my hazmat suit. Take that. Oh, oh. You're so cute, huh? 
And then the little boy <laughs> rocked his mommy. <laughs> oh, I love you forever. I like you too. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. Oh, well you take it and you fold it from corner to corner. No, I'm, I'm asking the question, how do moms do all of this? How do they handle it all? Well, maybe they have goggles we don't know about. It's as if God gave moms a special way of looking at things, you know? Okay, who taught you servanthood? Who modeled grace? Who gave you a taste of what God's love could look like? My mom, Mr. T, and my mom. Anyway, I, I just think God gave moms a special way of looking at things. Hey, honey. Hey, how's it going at home? It's all good. Guess you could say I'm starting to catch a glimpse of what your world looks like. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Mama. Hold on, your daughter wants to say something to you. I did mama. She says she misses you. And she realizes how important you are in her life. And she doesn't know how you do it. And she knows that she can't make it without you. She said all that, huh? I don't know if she said it. But it's what I wanted to say. And I should have said it a lot sooner. I thank God for you. The twins. Um, it, it was nothing. We, we have to go, okay? Um, lo love you, Mommy. humor about some of the things that uh, moms uh, may see that I got to admit sometimes guys don't. So really appreciate uh, uh, my mother, the upbringing I had, and uh, also for my wife, the things that we've been able to accomplish in our lives. So today let's sing Jesus' name above all names. Oh. 
an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. And I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. We're grateful for that song and the commitment that that gives to us, that we have made that commitment to follow Jesus Christ regardless of the cost, and uh, no turning back, no turning back. And I think what a wonderful uh, commitment to be able to make together there with that. So we think of this, we uh, thank you for your giving and the faithfulness of your support. Uh, we have been able to continue forward, and we've been grateful that you've continued your giving, and you've done a wonderful job with that, and we're blessed by that. As we look at that, uh, just kind of remind us there again the three ways that we have of giving there. If you want to uh, do that, uh, you can mail it there to the address there. You can drop it off, and we've had several do that. And then uh, one that we've been doing lately, and we've kind of had a growing number of people doing that, is the online option. Uh, if you don't want to have to touch it, or uh, if you're like me, that I know that I very rarely carry cash uh, or checks anymore, and so you can just pull that card out, and it's a safe way of doing that. Uh, and so we appreciate your faithfulness together there with the giving. We also ask that you pray for us. And uh, uh, we are in a, certainly in unusual and extraordinary times. And as we are, are making decisions, uh, we ask that you would pray for us. Uh, just kind of attentively to let you know, we are, are looking at the possibility of resuming some in-person services as well as we continue our online services uh, there for the time being, but tentative date, uh, there is May 24th, we will get more information out to you here uh, in the next days here, and so be paying attention, be paying attention here to the Facebook page, be looking for uh, some information in the mail, as well as in your email, uh, there are some things that we have to prepare and that we need you to participate, to prepare together there with us. And so be looking forward to that, but also be praying for that. As we look at that, I, I think it's a wise thing that we pray for our country and we pray both for the physical health of that. We know that it's had an economic impact. The, the sad news we heard this week is that these are some of the highest unemployment numbers that we've had since the Great Depression. And, and I wasn't alive back in the Great Depression. I don't know what that was like, but I, what I've heard is I know it wasn't good. And I know, it's, it's, I know many are hurting and struggling now and so that we can continue to pray for them there in that. And I think it's wise that we pray for our leaders. I, I'm grateful I'm not sitting in our governor's place or in the president's place or in some of those places because uh, those are difficult and painful decisions that you have to make uh, that impact a lot of people's lives. And uh, so let's pray for them that God will give them wisdom. As we come together today, obviously we want to take the time to thank God for our mothers and uh, the wonderful blessing and uh, example and teaching that they've given to us and we're grateful to our mothers uh, there we're grateful to God for giving us the mothers that he has and uh, so let's take the opportunity today so let's spend just a few moments here as we go to the Lord together in prayer Lord we uh, just want to come together and Lord as we come through this time we uh, are looking towards the future we're looking uh, to the possibility of both the economy reopening again and so God we pray for those that are hurt uh, there economically for those that maybe have been furloughed or laid off during this time. We pray that you would 
uh, work in their lives, that you'd meet their needs, that you would just be with them there. Let them know that they're not alone, that you love and you care for them, even though they may be going through a time of stress and pain right now, Lord, that you're there with them. We pray for wisdom as we speak of reopening both the church and we uh, look of reopening the economy. Uh, we ask for your wisdom and for your protection, that you would give us the wisdom as we move forward to do what is right, wise, and best for those that we lead. We also ask, Lord, that you would protect. You would protect the people both from this virus and from the uh, effects of it there, that you would keep us safe. Lord, we know that we uh, are in your care and that ultimately our health and our well-being comes from you. And, God, we are grateful for the health that you've given to us, and we're thankful for that. And, Lord, as we speak of thanking, Lord, we thank you for our mothers and the impact that they've made in our life. Um, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And, Lord, for those that have been involved, that have done great jobs of teaching and, and caring and loving, Lord, we thank you for them. And, Lord, we uh, thank you for those who are mothers, that you would just guide them, that you would be with them, that you would bless them on this day. And, Lord, may it be a day that we show our gratitude of what you've done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to open up to... Uh, for uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1 is uh, there, the Apostle Paul is addressing Timothy, uh, his protege in the faith. Uh, Timothy is the young pastor that uh, Paul has helped to minister and to teach and to lead, and uh, he's beginning to address them. And we're going to look at a passage there uh, that uh, kind of just uh, key in on a couple verses where Timothy looks at the heritage that he received there from his mother. Uh, it's interesting as we, we look at Timothy, not much is spoken of his mother. There's a little bit there that's spoken of. Uh, the passage that we're going to look at today as well as uh, Acts chapter 16 verse 1. Uh, and it would be interesting for me to be there in Acts chapter 16 verse 1 is where Paul is coming back to Lystra uh, the second time. He, in Acts chapter 14, helped to start the church. They got it going, then he kind of went on to the next town to start the church. They may, circled back to Jerusalem where they gave a report, and then after the Jerusalem Council report, they begin their second missionary journey. And one of the places that he goes is he goes back to Lystra uh, there to revisit the churches that he started and to kind of confirm those there. And so I, I kind of imagine it was something like this. It was probably on a Sunday morning that Paul arrives in Lystra. He goes to the house, the courtyard that the church is meeting at, and uh, he tries to slip in unnoticed as the worship service is just beginning. And he there listens, and he looks around in that crowd, and there's a lot of unfamiliar faces, people that he doesn't recognize anymore because they've joined the church. Uh, they've been... Uh, uh, trusted Christ as Savior, and they're growing in the faith since Paul's left. And so he kind of sneaks in, he finds a place, and somebody that doesn't recognize him kind of pulls up a stool or a chair next to him. And uh, the pastor gets ready to begin teaching, all looks across the crowd, and all of a sudden he says, Ah, we've got a special treat here today. He says, uh, Paul is here with us. And Paul, you may not realize that Paul started the church, and so he calls Paul up, and Paul gives a special address to the crowd. and teaches the crowd that day. And then after church that Sunday, uh, they're talking. And, and uh, as they're watching, as the other people are kind of clearing the things after their meal and, and cleaning up, one of the leaders of the church says, you know that, that, that young guy, Timothy, he is a sharp guy. Paul, you really need to come meet him. And so Paul and Timothy meet. And Paul says, you know, Timothy, I, would, would you like to meet me for coffee tomorrow? He sits down and talks with Timothy. And he begins talking about his faith. And so, Timothy, how would you come to faith in Christ? And so it was really... It was, it was my mom, and, and she was the one that helped to lead me. When she trusted Christ as Savior, her life radically changed. And my grandmother, uh, they you know, were really influential. And, and so, Timothy, I see you're, you're serving in the church. Where, where did you learn? Well, you know, my mom really began to like to serve, and, and she'd bring me along with that. And, and then I saw there was a need that some of the young people weren't being taught. And I know I was blessed. I was taught when I was younger. And, and so I wanted to kind of just do that. So I began kind of just helping to teach some of the kids. There's the, the church services going on. And I believe if you had talked to Timothy, one of the names that you'd hear again and again would be the names of Lois and the names of Eunice, mom and grandma. Uh, they were influential here in my life. I think when we look over back to the church history, we often look at giants of the people that we see. We realize that giants are often giants because they stand on the shoulders of others. Um, and one of those shoulders that they stand on, I believe, is the shoulders of mothers. 
has been influential mothers. We could talk of church history of uh, some of the church fathers like Augustine of Hippo. And you can't tell the story of Augustine of Hippo and the impact that he's had on the church without telling the story of Monica, his mother. Uh, and the way that she prayed for him. And even when he was running away from faith and running away from Christ, uh, Monica was faithful to pray for him and to share the gospel with him and to continue to love on him there. Uh, you probably driving around have passed a Methodist church. And we know the impact that, that Methodist, the Methodist church have had upon society. Uh, they trace their roots directly back to two brothers, John and Charles Wesley. You can't speak of John and Charles Wesley without speaking of Susanna Wesley, the mother of nine children who even in poverty and hard times was faithful to teach her children, uh, helped to kind of raise a farm to make sure that her children were provided for. When uh, the Philan pastor uh, wasn't doing a very good job, she decided to take upon herself to do family devotions. And soon guests wanted to come join their family devotions, and that family devotions had to leave the home and move to another location because she had up to 200 people just joining her for family devotions. Uh, the constant prayers that she had for her two sons, who there as John was on a ship back from uh, being a missionary in the United States, trusted Christ the Savior. And the story has changed. The giants stand on the shoulders of others, and often those shoulders there are mother. And I think the same here is with Timothy. Uh, we often, when we speak of Timothy and the young man Timothy is whom the book First and Second Timothy is named after, we often talk of Timothy as a, the protege of Paul, the, kind of the, the son of the faith of Paul. Uh, but you don't get to Timothy, the protege of Paul, Timothy, the young pastor, Timothy, uh, the one who helps to plant churches and train young men and uh, young women for the ministry without talking of Lois and Eunice. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open that together there with me in uh, 1 Timothy chapter, or sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you found 1 Timothy, just go a few pages over. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting there in verse 3. And, and even as we get into this, I think one of the important lessons that we can learn that are important for us right now is that we don't have to let our circumstances dictate our attitude. The Apostle Paul is writing 2 Timothy from a prison. Uh, we suspect the Mamertine prison in Rome, probably chained to two soldiers, so he's in a dungeon chained to soldiers, uh, and he's doing that for preaching the gospel. He's awaiting his trial, and what church tradition teaches us is there at that trial he'll be condemned and he'll be executed uh, there. So he knows very well that he is marching towards his own death and execution there for preaching the gospel. Uh, if we have circumstances that would cause us to be discouraged, those would be some of the circumstances. And yet, you'll notice Paul's attitude here in this. Notice here in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you and being mindful of your tears that I am filled with joy. You'll notice that Paul is both thankful and joyful. Our circumstances don't dictate our attitude. Uh, we get the opportunity to choose that because of our faith. But then he goes on to say there in verse 5, When I call to remembrance that genuine faith that is in you, which is first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There in verse 5 is the, the kind of the verse that we're going to key in on there in verse 5. The, when I call to remembrance that genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded, is in you also. He's saying, Timothy, I, when I look back and I remember you and I remember the times together and I look at that wonderful heritage of faith that you received from your mother and from your grandmother. And that's the heritage of faith the Holy Spirit was able to take and was able to use in your life and is now calling you and putting you into the ministry and is giving you the spirit of boldness and of love and of a sound mind to serve Christ. Uh, that heritage of faith that you received is wonderful. And I'm grateful. I rejoice in remembering that. And I think when we think of mothers, we're grateful for the heritage of faith that they leave here in our life. 
And so I want to challenge you, if you're a mother, that as we look at this, and uh, maybe you can look back at this and thank God for the mother that maybe left the heritage of faith. We had the privilege of teaching and preaching in a nursing home, and, and it was we gathered together the residents here in that nursing home, and we do our worship service in the nursing home. One of the, after there, we'd talk to the residents. One of the residents would always say, I'm so grateful for the Christian home that I was raised up in. And that woman uh, had a wonderful perspective. If you've been blessed with a Christian home, you have a wonderful gift that God's given to you. And maybe if you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you have the opportunity to begin that heritage of faith there for your children and for your grandchildren. You have the opportunity to impact and change generations to come. As we look at this passage this morning, a couple of things I want to challenge and encourage you with there together with that. Notice the first one is this, is that Lois and Eunice had a sincere faith. He speaks here of that genuine faith. What I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which for, dwelt first in your grandmother Lois. And that idea that that faith dwelt in them, uh, that, that it was comfortable, that it had a home. And so we understand that this faith came because they had trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior to change and transform their life. That's what, what happens when we trust Jesus Christ as Savior. When we receive His saving grace in our life, our lives are forever transformed. And we're set on a new course, a new destiny because of what Jesus Christ has done together there for us. Uh, we don't know who trusted Christ as Savior. It's interesting as we study this, it's very possible that Lois, the grandmother, came to faith in Christ first. She may have been some of the Apostle Paul's first converts in Lystra there in Acts chapter 14. It may have been Eunice. It may have been Eunice that came to faith in Jesus Christ first. Uh, but they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's the, the call for all of us. Each of us at some point in time need to recognize that we're sinners separated from God, that we can't get to God on our own, and that Jesus Christ came and He died on the cross for us, rose again to give us new life, and we each need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. They had put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and it had forever changed their life. One of the other interesting things we see about here is when you talk about biblical faith, uh, biblical faith or genuine faith is a faith that involves the whole person. Uh, it's more than just a mental agreement. It's not just saying, like, oh, I really like Jesus Christ and I think he's really good. And, and I, I recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin and I recognize that I have that need. Uh, but genuine faith means that I put my faith and trust wholly in Jesus Christ and there is a change that is brought about. When we trust Jesus Christ as Savior, we're not the same people that we were before. That's why the, the Scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, genuine faith is a faith that involves all of our being. Uh, it's more than just a mental agreement, and it results in a life change. And so that's one of the things that we want to examine. Is there a genuine faith in our life? Can we say as Timothy and as Lois and as Eunice that we possess a genuine faith that I can look back in my life and I can say this is what my life was like before Jesus Christ and this is what my life was like after Jesus Christ. And I can see the difference that Jesus Christ has made. And I'm not perfect. I don't got all the things down. I'm not without sin. Uh, I'm not maybe not without struggle. But there's been a change. And I can notice the change that Jesus Christ has brought about. And if we can't say that, then we need to go back and re-examine our life. The Apostle Paul could say, I know there was faith in Lois, and I know there was faith in Eunice, because we look at their life and we can see a difference. There was a change in their attitude. There was a change in their action. There was a change in the way that they behaved and the way that they worshipped. And that came about because of Jesus Christ. But I think it's also encouraging for us as we look at this passage that we realize that the road to faith sometimes is a broken road. And you would say, well, how do we get that? Um, well, if you go back to Acts chapter 16, verse 1. So if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 16, verse 1. This is one of the other few times that were mentioned at Timothy there. Uh, and that's kind of the story that we were looking at there. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, it says that, Then he came to Derbe and to Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman, who believed, but her father, uh, his father was a Greek. Now, it helps us to understand a little bit of the background in Scripture uh, there to understand a little bit of what's going on. And so why we can say that sometimes faith comes through a broken road is that we know that uh, Eunice is a Jew. 
Uh, she's grown up in a Jewish household. The way that Jews would trace their bloodline or their lineage is through the mother. Uh, and so Eunice is a Jew, so that means that Timothy is a Jew. But we know that Eunice married a Greek, uh, uh, someone who is of non-Jewish blood. Uh, and so we don't know when Eunice came to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but we also know this, that she had the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, uh, there as she was in Judaism, that if she had been faithful uh, there to Judaism, she would have married inside of Judaism. But we don't know what happened, but we know that she's married outside of Judaism. Perhaps it was an arranged marriage that uh, Lois maybe had done the same thing, that she had married outside of the faith. And uh, there's Lois and her husband saw Eunice getting towards marrying age. They arranged the marriage between Eunice and Timothy's father. Maybe it was a choice of Eunice's. That she found someone that she fell in love with. It gives us the warning of this. And I want to speak for just a few moments to those who are young people, who are uh, teenagers and young adults who are dating and not yet married. It reminds us of the scripture passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It reminds us to be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That if you're looking at that and you're considering the person to marry, the one that you love. The scripture is very clear that we're not to be married or to marry unbelievers. And it's not because we don't care about unbelievers. It's not because they're not, not nice, wonderful people. And maybe this young man or this young woman is just a wonderful woman. Uh, it's because we understand this, that we're on two different paths. That if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're faithful to Jesus Christ, your life is headed in this direction. And if you're unsaved, you're a person of the world, your life is headed in this direction. And while you may seem like you're kind of going in the same way now, if you're going to be faithful to follow Jesus Christ and not give up your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, there's going to be a point in the time where you guys will start heading in a different direction. And what you think is, oh, it's okay now, we're in love, I'll win him to faith in Christ later, it's not a big deal. He, he says he believes in God. If that, their faith in Jesus Christ isn't evident, uh, then... As lovingly, as compassionately as I can say, you have no business dating them. Because you're going in different directions, and even though it may seem okay now, later on there's going to be conflict, there's going to be strife, there's going to be heartache and heartbreak because you're moving in different directions. And so I, I, if you're not married right now, what I want to say to that young person dating or that young person considering dating, uh, make sure that you follow this scriptural directive. Don't marry an unbeliever, a spiritually mismatched marriage. It will only create heartache and heartbreak. And if you could go to those, you might know somebody in the church, maybe you even have a loved one, a, a family member that maybe have done that. If you could sit down and honestly talk to them, they'd tell you of the difficulties and the pains that this has created in their life. Even if that unsafe spouse is supporting of their, their faith, uh, there's something that they don't share in common where they don't have intimacy. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, a wise pastor of mine once said, every date is a possible mate. That doesn't mean you go on the first date and say, are you going to marry? I think we're called to be married. Uh, no, it means that I don't date anyone that I wouldn't be willing to marry. If I'm not willing to marry this person, I have no business dating them. Uh, because every relationship and every marriage usually starts with that first date. And so uh, if you're not willing to marry them, don't begin that first date together there with them. But here, it also reminds us of the wonderful grace of God. Because while it's very possible and very probable that Eunice probably strayed from her faith, that maybe there was a rebellious time and phase in her life, she walked away from uh, her faith and there, she walked away from the Scriptures and the Old Testament of knowing what she should do, she married there somebody outside of her faith, something happened in her life that brought her back. And perhaps it was the birth of Timothy. As Timothy is being born, she begins to look at, at greater questions and deeper questions. She begins to look at her Jewish heritage and the, the Scriptures and begins to study the Scriptures again. Perhaps it was when somebody shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with her and she trusted Jesus Christ as Savior uh, that she said, I, I've got to get back to my faith. And when she came back, she came back with a genuine faith. Uh, that's what the scripture reveals, that her faith was not a, it's a genuine faith. And God has the ability to restore even those that have wandered away. And I, I think that's a wonderful encouragement because even some of us, as we're looking at this, 
are looking at prodigals and the faith. We talk of uh, having a genuine faith and a heritage of faith, and you've done your best as a mother and as a father uh, to raise your children up in the faith, and tragically you begin to see them drifting away from Jesus Christ. I want to continue to encourage you to keep praying for them. You never know what God's going to do. Their story is not over yet. God has the ability to change and to transform and to bring back. And so here in Eunice's life, he brought Eunice back to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and when she embraced that faith, that faith is a genuine faith that she then not only uh, changes and transforms her life and her destiny, it changes and transforms the destiny of her son Timothy as she begins to lead Timothy there in that faith. And how grateful we even are for those single mothers uh, or uh, spiritually single mothers who are leading their families in faith in Jesus Christ and doing the best that they can. Lois and Eunice had a sincere faith. Paul recognizes that and God recognizes that because it comes to us here through the inspiration of Scripture. Not only do they have a sincere faith, they passed on a, unit, uh, a heritage of faith. And what a blessing that it is of this, that we have the opportunity to give this heritage a genuine faith to your family. Uh, that's grateful for us because sometimes as we look at this maybe as we're talking about this idea of a heritage of faith you might be saying well pastor you don't understand where I came from I'm the first in my family to trust Jesus Christ as Savior and as the first in my family I don't have that heritage of faith I I don't know what you're talking about of that well here realize this that God is giving you the opportunity to begin that heritage of faith And I know that as we speak to a crowd like this, we even speak to those that have been through the heartache and the heartbreak of maybe being abandoned by their mothers. Uh, Maybe mothers left when they were young, and and so we speak of Mother's Day. Mother's Day is a painful day for them because it reminds them of what they don't have. I want to encourage you here by the grace of God and through His saving grace and saving faith that you have the opportunity to change. You don't have to repeat what the past has been. You can change the future and you can begin today to leave a heritage of faith for your children and to impact the generations yet to come. When Lois came to faith in Jesus Christ and Lois was faithful in her faith there to God, it wasn't just her life that she impacted. It was Eunice's life. It was Timothy's life. And as we look at Timothy, it wasn't just Timothy. We don't know what Timothy's family was like, whether he had children or grandchildren, uh, but we know that he had children and grandchildren in the faith. Timothy says, the same things that you've heard to me, you commit to faithful men that they may teach others. And we look at that chain that, that Timothy's life of his faith radically changes and transforms the lives of others. Uh, when you fully surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you don't have the opportunity just to change yours. You have the opportunity to leave a heritage of faith, to transform generations to come. What a blessing that is to realize it is we're not just living for this very moment. We're living for generations that are yet to come. Maybe children and great-grandchildren. We were blessed to have uh, Mary Lane with us for many years. And what a blessing it was to see four generations of Mary Lane's family worshiping Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to impact generations. Not only... Lois and Eunice give this gift of the heritage of faith to their children and grandchildren. Uh, They also passed on a love for the Word of God. Part of that heritage of faith was a love for God's Word. Uh, How do we know they passed on a love for God's Word? Well, if you have your Bibles, you're there in 2 Timothy. Flip over a couple pages to 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul is speaking in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. is one of the greatest passages that we have on the inspiration of Scripture that, that gives us the clearest uh, teaching there of the inspiration of Scripture. But before we get to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we have verse 15. And the Apostle Paul is encouraging this young Timothy to be confident in the Scriptures here. And he says this, he says that from a childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He says, Timothy, you've, you've known these Scriptures, these Old Testament Scriptures, and now that they were writing the New Testament Scriptures at the time of Paul, He says, you've known these scriptures from your childhood. Uh, So it it kind of gets us thinking of a couple different things about this as we look at this. Uh, One of the things is this, is uh, who taught Timothy the scriptures from the childhood? Well, who had a genuine faith? Lois and Eunice. Who passed on that genuine faith? Lois and Eunice. So how did they pass on the genuine faith? Part of that uh, was by their love of the scriptures. They passed on that 
genuine faith to Timothy through a love of the Scriptures. I'm sure it was probably there uh, through sitting and, and teaching Timothy. And maybe they taught Timothy to read there uh, by reading the Scriptures. Maybe it was when Timothy would kind of uh, sneak down early in the morning and catch Eunice there by the window as she's uh, reading the Scriptures. And, and I think it's even challenging to realize this, that they didn't have the Scriptures like we did. Uh, was, we've got no excuse. If, if you come to my house today, uh, I probably have three or four different... Uh, copies of the Bible. Actually, I've got more than that. Uh, but each of my kids probably have, you know, one or two copies of the Bible. We've got an abundance of the Scripture in our house. Uh, we know there are some places in the developing world and in the persecuted church that they don't even have one copy of the Bible per family or per household. Sometimes it's not even one copy of the Bible per church. And so here in their days, it was probably, since it was so expensive to, to get a copy of the Scripture, they were all handwritten uh, it probably would have been one copy per church, if that. So the only time they would have been exposed to the Scripture is there uh, when they would have came together to worship the Lord, they would have listened to the reading. Uh, but I believe that because of that, they had a much greater memory than we do. When they would hear it, they would begin to commit to memory those things. Maybe they take the opportunity to write it on a clay tablet or something that they could keep for a later time. Uh, but they put it to memory uh, there, that scripture. They taught it. They taught the Bible stories. Uh, they witnessed Lois and Eunice sharing their faith with others. And Timothy was taught a love of the Word of God from his youth. We're going to pass on this heritage of faith. Part of passing on the heritage of faith is passing on a love for the Word of God. We need to daily engage the Word of God. One of the, the best things that we can do to stir up faith and love for Jesus Christ in our hearts is to daily engage God's Word. Daily spend time in His Word. It may be a, a phone app. You may start a phone app. And you've got a digital download of the Bible there on your phone and you've got a daily devotional on your phone that you're using. Uh, it may be your grandmother's family Bible that you sit down and read daily. Uh, it, it may be, oh, I know one of the, the treasures that I have is a, a Bible that was passed down from my family members, from my grandparents. Uh, and it's got their notes and it's got notes about their family. And what a blessing it is to see that wonderful heritage. Now, I don't daily read that Bible, but that one's a treasure for me to keep because it showed the love of the Word of God that they had uh, that hopefully that we're passing on to our family. We pass on a heritage of faith when we pass on a love for the Word of God. The best way to show a love for the Word of God is to demonstrate it in our actions and not just to talk about it. But we also see number three is this, is that Lois and Eunice's faith was the basis of their discipleship of Timothy. Lois and Eunice discipled Timothy in the faith. They set the foundation so that it was later in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, when Paul comes through again, that there's people in the church that say, hey, you've got to check out Timothy. Man, this is a sharp young man. And man, he, he's really good. He knows the word of God. And man, he's got a heart to serve. And he loves people. And, and this Timothy guy, he's a great young guy. And it's soon after that, as we continue on in Acts chapter 16, that Timothy uproots his life, begins to uh, follow the apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, and begins probably the, the formal, the informal training uh, that would later lead him there. Uh, but who laid the foundation? Well, we see this, that mom and grandma took the responsibility to teach Jesus, uh, Timothy to love Jesus. It reminds us of this wonderful truth, right? Uh, this is a kind of a convicting truth, but it's, it's necessary that we're reminded of it, and that is this. Uh, the responsibility for discipleship of your children belongs to the parents in the home. The home is the primary place that discipleship takes place. Now, I want you to realize this. We, uh, we try and do our best. We've got some wonderful Sunday school teachers, some wonderful junior church teachers. Uh, Pastor Brian does a great job with the young people. But understand that all of those are supplements to support and assist you as parents to teach and train the Word of God. When we look at this, don't come and say, well, you know, my children just aren't, aren't kind of following Christ, and I don't know what the church is doing. They're not do no. We're here to assist you. God's given the primary responsibility of teaching and training children to parents. 
And I'm grateful that Lois and Eunice took that responsibility seriously. They were the ones that there, uh, uh, when Timothy was young, would put Timothy on their knee. And uh, the stories that they would tell would be Bible stories. They were the ones that when they were going out to serve and, and to say, hey, we go out and to serve those who are a little uh, maybe less fortunate than us, or go out and to care for the needs of others, and, and we do that because of what Jesus Christ has done. They were the ones that took Timothy by the hand and brought him with them. Uh, you see, we need to take spiritually responsibility. And so here, let me just say that I know that we're addressing a lot of this today towards our mothers, and we're grateful for our mothers and the impact. And I'm grateful for the godly example that my mother left in my life and the witness that she left. And I'm grateful for uh, the godly example that my wife leads. But I want to challenge you fathers for a moment here. Uh, you want to give a great Mother's Day gift to your wife? Then you come alongside of her and you assist her spiritually training your children. Don't leave the responsibility of discipleship and the spiritual life to your wife to say, oh, the God thing, so, you know, that, those, they kind of belong to my wife. No, God's called you to help to train and to lead your children as well. One of the greatest gifts that you could give your wife is to take on that role of spiritual leadership there within the home. What a wonderful Mother's Day gift that you could give together with that. And so I want to challenge you, uh, come alongside her, help her assist her with that. Uh, but discipleship begins in the home. And so there was a foundation that was laid first in the home, that genuine appetite to know God, the genuine faith uh, to know God, uh, that was often is more caught than it is taught. Uh, uh, we can do all the great classes and all the great lessons, but much of it is often the example that we live out in front of our children. That those uh, faith is often more caught than it is taught. This idea of serving, that serving first begins in the home, that generosity first begins in the home. Uh, we're not going to... Uh, learn any great lessons on a missions trip if we haven't first learned to serve at home. We're not going to learn to begin to share the gospel uh, on the mission field if we haven't begun to first share the gospel here at home. I want to encourage you with some of this. I want to encourage you, especially some of our younger mothers. I know that oftentimes when we talk of these things, we think of discipleship and ministering to others. We often think of great uh, acts of discipleship and ministry and uh, maybe somebody's teaching a large class and we think, man, that's, that's real ministry. That's real. I want to challenge you and encourage you that maybe especially for our young mothers, maybe this season of discipleship and ministry that God's called you to is ministering and discipling those children. And you think, well, that's, that's nothing glamorous about that. That's, that's just kind of routine and mundane and even at times is boring. And it, it's often just a lot of the same thing and, and a, a lot of, you know, caring for our kids and making sure they're fed and they got clean clothes and uh, making sure. I want you to understand that those things are not insignificant or not unimportant. That act of caring is the first act of serving and loving that your children are going to begin to see. The way that you create a safe environment at home uh, is the first that they'll begin to see of Jesus Christ. The way that they see you respond to the stress and to the difficult things uh, is how their faith begins to be formed. When you talk, as we mentioned earlier on, of some of the great giants in the faith, don't neglect to look at their mothers. Susanna Wesley, who had nine children, uh, much of her time was cared with caring for the house, of planting a garden and caring for a garden so that her kids were fed. Uh, it wasn't often in the great things that we talk about. It was often in the mundane things. But faith is lived out in the mundane and it's the simple daily choices that we make that make the greatest difference. And so if God's placed you in this time and this season, realize as you talk to older mothers, and they'll tell you this, Mike, enjoy that because it goes by so quickly. And I know for some of our younger mothers, it's hard to enjoy it because it's so exhausting and you're tired and the kids are getting up way too early. Uh, but this season will go faster than you realize. So embrace the idea that God's called you to disciple these. And if you make the impact of discipling these children, uh, who knows the impact that you'll have 
when Susanna was uh, caring for John and Charles Wesley, uh, she wasn't expecting to change the world. She was just expecting to change their hearts. But by changing their hearts, she changed the world. The foundation was first laid at home. But because that foundation was laid at home, the Holy Spirit was able to take that and was able to use that there to change the world. Notice, if we come back to our passage there in 1 Timothy, uh, there he speaks of this. The Holy Spirit took that work that was begun at home, he incubated and grew that work, and he changed the world through it. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift that was in you through the laying on of hands for the Holy Spirit. Or for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He says, Timothy, that, that gift that you have that was recognized when your ordination that the Holy Spirit gave to you, that was uh, kind of built upon the foundation of the faith that you received, that you saw there in your mother and your grandmother, um, you keep that going. You keep stirring that up and it reminds us that oftentimes we've got to stir up our faith we've got to stir up our gifts and sometimes we need to be stirred up again uh, so you keep stirring up that that faith and then he goes on to say but god's not given us that spirit of, of fear of a, a timidity of of drawing back and as we look at uh, timothy there's a couple things we see about timothy maybe that one of the his character traits is that he's a, a little bit of an introvert that he he doesn't enjoy being out there in front of people even though he, he's there in the ministry uh, so there's a little bit of timidity that sometimes when he should press forward, he pulls back. And so he says, realize this, the Holy Spirit's not given us that spirit of timidity, but it's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, of discernment, of wisdom, that self-discipline that comes. And that's a gift, a work of the Holy Spirit there in our life. And so, Timothy, God's calling you to move forward, not to move backward, but you can move forward be what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life because of that foundation that was laid in your life. You, you came to, to faith through the work and the ministry of your mother and your grandmother. They laid a wonderful foundation of discipleship of what it meant to follow Jesus Christ and what that looked like. They provided a wonderful example. Now, Timothy, you take and you run with that. You, you let the Holy Spirit do His full work in your life. You serve Him to the full capacity. Don't uh, allow those things that, that maybe even some of the the, the kind of the, the character traits that would be natural for you that would hinder your ministry. Don't allow those to hinder your ministry, but you keep going. That work that goes on to change the world as Timothy then establishes churches there throughout Asia Minor as he begins to teach and to train others and to disciple them and they go out and start churches that start other churches and it begins this chain reaction of the gospel going forth and uh, Timothy is in a a key link in that chain reaction, that, that work that changes the world began at home. The great giant of the faith, Timothy, and the work that he does in starting and establishing churches and teaching and training others began because he had a mother and a grandmother who loved Jesus Christ and they wanted to pass on that love for Jesus Christ to their young son and grandson, Timothy, and so they take the daily time to sit them on their knee, to teach them the Word of God. They take the time to memorize Bible verses with them. They take the time to go to the homes of, of maybe an elderly person there in their church and just spend some time uh, drinking a cup of coffee and tea if they did that at that time. They demonstrated their faith. It was a genuine faith, and they demonstrated and lived out that genuine faith. And even in the simple tasks of caring for a home, of making sure there were meals on the table, that the clothes were folded and washed and mended, they demonstrate what service and love looked like. And Timothy could not run away from the example of faith because of the faith, the foundation that was laid by his parents. I want you to realize this mom you're doing one of the most important jobs in the world i know that we live in a world that often values uh, jobs done outside the home and, and and so oftentimes if you're looking at what you do inside the home you think it's kind of unimportant it's not uh, glamorous it's it's often unappreciated but i want to encourage you today mom to help you to realize this that what you're doing there inside the home is changing a life and as you change a life, you have the potential to change the world. Those mundane tasks are not unimportant. They set up the foundation of love and of security 
and they help to demonstrate what service looks like there. Uh, your attitude as you do those helps to teach and to train and provide that godly example of genuine faith. And so realize this, that it's not often through great acts, but it's the small daily tasks done in love, lived out in faith that change the world. And so moms today, we just want to take this special opportunity to say thank you to you. As we think of that, we think of a genuine faith. Uh, we won't want to miss this opportunity to say perhaps you don't have that heritage of faith. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you today, if, if you haven't done that, then make today that day. Begin a new heritage of faith in Jesus Christ for you and for your family uh, there. If you've never done that, we we'll encourage you to begin to do that. And you can do that right where you're at there. You can acknowledge your sin and recognize that, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Uh, I know that I, I can't get to heaven on my own. I can't do enough works to earn your favor and your grace. But I know that you died on the cross to rescue me from my sin. And so I put my faith and trust in you and ask you to forgive my sin and I give my life to you today. You can take that step of faith right where you're sitting today. If you've done so, uh, we would ask that you would do this, that you would contact us uh, either through the comments, maybe through Messenger. Uh, you might com uh, text us uh, through an email or through a text, but find some way to contact us and let us know about that. And then I want to challenge you with this. Uh, you're here today because of a mother. I, there's no way for you to be here today without a mother. Uh, and even if your mother wasn't the greatest of mothers, uh, you're here today because of a mother. Take the opportunity today to reach out to the mothers in your life and just say thank you. Thank you for maybe the practical things. Maybe it's just the gift of life. Or maybe if you've been blessed with that wonderful heritage of a godly mother, thank them for their wonderful faith and the heritage that they've left behind. And we're grateful for those. Let's take this opportunity to close our time together and to thank God for the mothers that we have. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful mothers that you've blessed us with. God, the heritage of faith that they've left for us, the godly example, God, we are grateful for that. It's a wonderful gift that comes from you. It's a demonstration of your grace because we didn't choose that, God. You placed that there for us. God, we're grateful for the faith of those that maybe. They're the first generation of faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't have a strong mother or godly example to look to. But God, because of the difference that you've made in their life and their genuine faith, you're creating a heritage for generations to come. That they are leaving a legacy of faith that will impact generations yet to come. And God, may you bless their children and their grandchildren, and may you bless them with the opportunity to see this wonderful heritage that is beginning new. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the second chances that we have in Jesus Christ, that if we straight away, we can come back, and God, you give the grace to restore, and we can have a genuine faith in you. And Lord, we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. We love, we care for you. We long for the time to be back together. But until then, may God bless and keep you. May God cause his face to shine upon you.